Welcome back to another episode of Radical Narrative. Glad to bring this one to you. As always, I am your host, Milan Tatusis, here on Radical Narrative. Glad you're listening. Glad to be here. We had this episode out on our Patreon for quite some time, so if you're not a Patreon subscriber and you want to get early listens to some of our episodes, be sure to get in on that. Today on the episode, I'm staying down with Geraldine King. She is an Anishinaabe Kwe, an Anishinaabe woman. I'll let her introduce herself. She's currently at McGill, where she's an instructor doing amazing work as a senior advisor for Indigenous curriculum and pedagogy in the Office of Indigenous Initiatives. We also both did our master's at the University of Victoria in Indigenous Governance. She's a PhD candidate. She's a mother. She's an amazing writer doing amazing work. Full of life, full of energy. I had the pleasure of sitting with her on a panel at the Native American Indigenous Studies Association Conference, big Native academic conference. Today on the podcast, we're discussing decolonizing kinships, love and intimacy. We touch on parenting. We touch on collective joy. It's an all around amazing conversation. If you like what you're listening to, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Follow us on Instagram. Subscribe to the Patreon if you want to help keep us financially afloat and going. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Geraldine King. As always, be sure to stay tuned and listen in. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks for sitting down with me, Geraldine. Um, I, I followed you on Instagram. I followed you on social media. And then we were on a panel together at NASA last year. And that's where, when I was listening to you speak and talk, I was like, this is a radical narrative episode right here. I like it. Good flow. Nice. Love it. Thought you were going to say radical native. I was like, yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it applies. I'm bad too. It applies. <laughs> it applies. Yeah. It applies. Yeah. So I'll let you introduce yourself, who you are, where you come from. Oh, just like that. Okay. I, I always say, I know who you are, but our guests don't know who you are. Our, our listeners don't know who you are. So jump into it. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, bonjour. My name is Geraldine King. I'm from a place called Keashkazaging Schnabek, which is on the western shores of Lake Nipigon, um, a couple hours north of Thunder Bay, if people are familiar with the area. Um, I'm also on a uh, band council there. I was elected in, it'll be two years in November. Um, one of the youngest uh, councillors elected. Um, and I'm also one of the furthest away. So I live. Oh gosh, like 1,600 kilometers from my community. I live in Ottawa. Um, and I thought that that was really cool and special that, you know, my community put their trust in me, knowing that I live so far away. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, in my professional life, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Integrated Studies and Education in the Faculty of Education at McGill University in Montreal. And I'm also the senior advisor on Indigenous curriculum and pedagogy in the Office of Indigenous Initiatives. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you're also a, a mom. You have children. Yes, you're doing it all. <laughs> I have lots of children. <laughs> yeah, doing it all. In my free time, I like uh, long walks along the trap line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doing it all. It's amazing. It's a really amazing um, biography you have in terms of what you're doing, how you're helping your community, you're in academia, doing a lot of cool academic stuff on that side, but also you're, you're a mother, right? And I think that's how we started to relate and speak to in context to, to children and just observing society in that way. Yeah, um, yeah. So I wanted to position that. Like, I wanted to position who you are in terms of how you introduced yourself, but also we're in the era of pretendianism. We're in the right. era of really, like, I don't know. We, we had a conversation with some of our listeners about um, positionality and, and right. they wanted some, but they, they were requesting guests with really clear positionality, like somebody right. who's like legitimately from our community, because there is some positionality yeah. statements out there that are kind of wild, you know what I mean? Right. Like, and and we, we're trying to avoid that in our, right. in our episodes. But I wanted you to speak to your origin story of okay. self and family. Yeah. Like what's your family yeah. story? Well, I guess like off the top, I'm not a Fojibwe. We don't have to worry about <laughs> that. I'll state that. 
for the record. Um, so I was actually born in Toronto. Oh, that's one thing I should say. I never uh, grew up in my community, but I've always had ties to my community from my family has like always, 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 always been there. Um, I grew up, I was born in Toronto uh, to my mom. She was single at the time. Um, she was like just turned 18, I think, uh, maybe 17. No, she was 18. Um, spent some time there for a few years and went back to Thunder Bay. And there's a lot of reasons why she left Thunder Bay as like a young Anishinaabe woman at 17. Uh, she joined what was what we would call like kind of a circus, but I forget the name. It was like one of these like Ringling Brothers or something. It wasn't that, but it, it had a name. And she found out she was pregnant. As far as I understand, she was in North Dakota. So she she just had a lot of kind of, and I'm not going to tell like her full story, but she didn't want to go back to Thunder Bay at that point in time. So we ended up um in Toronto uh she had me there uh I ended up being in a house fire when I was like nine months old so then I spent some time in the Catholic Children's Aid Society and in, in Toronto um and then immediately after I was uh, my mom fought to get me back so I didn't end up kind of taken up into the system we went back to Thunder Bay um and then after that we just sort of spent time all over Canada like it was always sort of something right um and uh I ended up settling I, I guess in Ottawa my mom came here when I was like 12 so I've kind of always been here I, I established a family here I had a child with someone from Kitagon Zivi which is a very close first nation here so uh when I was very young too so I just never ended up leaving uh just remaining my my son close to his father's first nation um I, I actually and it's funny that you're asking me this now but I never knew who my father was like all all my life and I just found out from you guess it <laughs> ancestry dna oh wow interesting <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so that's kind of a new thing i'm not really um it's just a new thing i'm exploring mm -hmm. but um i always knew i was kind of of european ancestry like on on whatever side that would be mm -hmm. uh, well my father's side so i'm ojibwe and figuring out my white roots that um hopefully i can gain some privilege and benefit from me <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> hopefully i could get some of that white privileges <laughs> yeah go back to europe get some land right <laughs> yeah exactly but um anyhow so that was kind of um yeah i'm just sort of exploring that mm -hmm. i always sort of knew it but i didn't know who exactly yeah and that's uh that's been a new thing and it kind of is um i guess it's interesting because of like identity right and yeah you, you think about that um but i only have always only know myself as Ojibwe because mm. that's just who I, I only grew up with my mom um and our family like that side of our family I have a really huge family uh we're very politically my family the King family has always been politically involved in like all sorts of things in northwestern Ontario whether Gull Bay and the surrounding areas Thunder Bay urban uh, urban First Nations and Anishinaabe initiatives uh so that's kind of like who I am one thing I really explored, like we were, we were both in the Indigenous Governance Program and, and a lot of the things that I explored there, even at that time, was about identity. And it really reflected on how I was able to maintain like an Anishinaabe identity, but also a very specific Lake Nipigon, like where we're from identity. And we can get into a little bit more, but like it's really the humor that yeah. emerges from those lands that are reflective of like those lands and those peoples and those totally. waters. And also the language. So there's yeah. language that's very, very, very specific to um, not just like Lake Nipigon area. There, there is. There's all sorts of dialects, but also Gaul Bay. There's a very specific dialect of Anishinaabe language, and my grandfather was um, kind of like uh, very prominent in our I mean, people would come to him to learn that specific dialect. So that's how I I feel like I always stayed particularly like anchored to to my First Nation, ever not having ever really grown up there. Yeah, that's really cool. And I like it because there's authenticity, there's truth in this, right? The reality of being able to speak to it and, and highlight it. Like, I feel like that's what some of our listeners wanted to really begin to uh, foster on some of our episodes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's truth to that. Like, there's truth to to who you are and where you come from. And it's true. Like, it's really true in terms of even my experience at iGov, um, really positioning myself. I grew up in my community. Like, I'm a res kid. <laughs> right. And I think that's part of, like, my dynamic of <laughs> in my relationship to academia is that I'm first and foremost a res kid. Mm -hmm. And me going to university and school was to get through to go back to the res. And now that I'm right. in the res, right. I'm kind of positioned here. I'm kind of like, this is my life. This is where I'm from. 
Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's really cool to hear it. And especially the aspect of humor, right? Because that's something that I feel like I'm I'm drawn to you in that way. Like yeah. for me, like the re- the reality for like indigenous people, indigenous people, like the ones who are in sort of like the the immediate social circle is that when you walk into the room and you hear the jokes and the humor, you right. know those are your people. <laughs> like, right. You know those are the people that, <laughs> that are like, yeah. you know, I, like for lack of a word, better word, that you will legitimately connect with. Like the humor is going to yeah. be there, right? So, right. and that's sort of what how I felt drawn to you. I was like, oh yeah, okay, we're on the same page here. Like the same social cues, the same humor is right. there. Yeah. Right. The same like mannerisms. <laughs> <laughs> and Galbe has like a very distinct like, mannerisms too and mm-hmm. and I think that's what's kept me um really connected because I did have those kind of struggles too even as being a counselor right that's mm-hmm. off yeah off reserve uh didn't grow up in the community but always had really close familial ties and 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 things like that and just like a, a connection to my community grappling with like my own authenticity in that in that um schematic right mm-hmm. like and having those kind of judgments thrown at me too and and like trying to have navigating it in the sense that the people that are living in the First Nation, I'm not going to necessarily embody like what what they experience on the on the day to day. Right. But through those like larger sort of kinship structures and my own my own familial connection to the community, um, visiting, being a part of now the political structure, um, I still have a responsibility towards my community, I feel like even as on, as someone that's sort of grown far, got grown, uh, grown up far away. Um, you know, having that that responsibility not to um what would like uh, what would the word be? Just kind of like not to um take on those stories yeah. of like growing up as a res kid or mm-hmm. or being on the res and people were referred to me like Geraldine, you're so resy. I'm like, I'm actually not. Like mm-hmm. I just am Ojibwe from Galbe, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. and I'd be I'm very mindful of not um appropriating. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That identity, because I I don't know exactly what it's like. Like I've spent a mm. lot of time, obviously, in on First Nations, staying for long, extended periods periods of time. But to kind of consider myself like a resident, mm. a resident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really appreciate that positionality. It's it's coming across crystal clear with how you're saying it and cool. speaking to it, right? And I, I love how you're demonstrating that too. Is like we simply have to. Ex- speak to our existences and, and where we come from um, because there is truth to that and I and I like and it just came up for me too because I was talking to one of my friends I grew up with about this about um, uh, res slang or our language learning in terms of how uh, we do we do as as kids who grew up on on the res we do recognize some of that slang as ours mm-hmm. like some of that slang that originated in the struggle of of you know right. uh, friends and family and even some friends who we lost right yeah. like one of the big contentious ones that I post about with on Facebook often is the term scoden like when people right. say it right because yeah. for me that's like a northern distinct slang right. that comes from the northern communities and we're seeing southern indigenous people in the u.s right. even through like artistry and 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 film right. start to appropriate that but then in my mind yeah. i'm kind of like mm, that's kind of ours you know because right. i do have cousins who who legitimately like started to speak that way like it, it comes up naturally right so yeah. you know which one's the point of contention for me that i hear so many people saying now or I was like, you did not grow up saying yeah, that. Yeah. I know it. Deadly. Uh, yeah. Like, Deadly. I, that, that was like, we would be telling all our stories, all our family, like, stories, all this lore, right? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, man, that guy's just deadly. Like, yeah, yeah. Our whole world ever deadly. Like, everything was just deadly. And now I hear people say it and it's all over things. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you you weren't saying that, like, 22 years ago. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. what, that's my point of contention. Yeah. But yeah, I think there's like, you know, a real responsibility for folks like myself not to appropriate those either. Right. And, mm. and they do emerge from a certain context and a space. And I was having a conversation with someone from from our program. And I said, I, th- I feel like if you embody it and you hear it, like you you're sort of immersed in that in that language or you're immersed in that, then then there could be a past to kind of bring it with you. But if you're learning it these days, like from social media, like I see people always like posting now on like Facebook and it annoys me too because I'm like, how would you say that? Like pronounce that, but they're writing it out, right? And it's the one that says H-O-H. Mm-hmm. How would you pronounce that? Ho. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> for us, it's like an extra like H H H H H H H. It's like oh. Oh, for you guys, <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, right? makes sense. Yeah. But I see people and they're like writing that, and I'm like, yeah. how would? And I want to ask them like in real life if I ever see them. I'm like, how would you pronounce that? Yeah. And it's like it's yeah. It's just I don't know. I feel I feel you on that one. Like I feel that. And maybe I'm like I'm a total overthinker, but I was I'm I'm always like sort of um, reflective of that, like not appropriating that as a as a mechanism of legitimization. I think that there's a there's a big problem with that, or you know. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And and yeah, my heart goes out to our listeners because, in all honesty, we we did survey some of our listeners, and we noticed that some of them are listening from the res. Some of them are right. listening while they're doing their art, their beating. Um, and interestingly enough, we're a commuter podcast, which I think is a dead given because oh, cool. I listen to podcasts commuting. So like right. the nearest town's forty five minutes for us. And there's listeners out there who identified as, yeah, we listen to this on the way to town to get our groceries. And that's sort of why we figured out this like one hour time frame for our podcast was that's the average, average drive time time to the city. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. But yeah, even like even the slang conversation, I think, is is really unique because we did identify it in some of our coffee houses with our guests that, you know, they want more localized on the ground uh, narratives coming out right. because I, I, and I, I do intentionally reach out to my friends for episodes. So some of them are academics, some of them are in academia. So there is a bit yeah. of a bias in selecting guests. Me. <laughs> yeah. But this conversation so far is is legitimate. Like, I like it. Okay, I really like good. it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to jump into your work now. Like I want to jump into what you do. Obviously you work in community in terms of being on council, right? And and that's a whole nother podcast when we talk about governance, chief of council. Right. <laughs> yeah, trust me, that's yeah. part two. <laughs> well, let me clarify, I'm speaking as a academic right now, not as a counselor, not as a like yeah, yeah. advisor. <laughs> Just FYI. For sure, for sure. Let's let's jump into like your your doctoral work then, like how it f- focuses on Anishinaabe erotics ethics of intimacy, even kinship studies. Um, and, and let's have that conversation. Let's see where that takes us. Okay, cool. Well, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, we'll go way back. <laughs> um, when I was at iGov, I was focusing on like Nishnabe humor as this liberatory um, praxis. And I took a course with Leanne Simpson as a part of our um, coursework. Mm-hmm. It was in our second term. And it was on uh, resurgence, right? So indigenous resurgence and just thinking through this. And at one point, I um, uh, she had brought in a lot was going on at that time for uh, bringing, bringing um, light to missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and just kind of uh, the sexual violence that's been so long standing and devastating mm-hmm. to our communities. Mm-hmm. And so we're reading a lot on that. Then at one point there, there I had been writing, um, I guess what would be considered like niche erotica, which mm-hmm. is a very distinct form, I think. Uh, for a little bit. And I I wrote, I remember writing Leanne Simpson as my professor and instructor and just being like, instead of writing like a theoretical perspective on this violence and the sexual violence and how to like resurge against it and like liberate ourselves, can I just write the type of Mm -hmm. like things that I write? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. So I ended up writing within, I think it was like a 10 page paper. So I just wrote 10 pages of various, there was some like short kind of poems and then there was these longer ones and um I don't even know if you call it poetry I handed in you know whatever and then and that was all good and then she uh Leanne ended up sending me some call for like um love stories uh for this journal so I submitted them she's like I, I think you should really submit these so I submitted them they got published and then people started like taking notice of them and they I got published on just different wow. websites decolonization yeah. journal indians.com like and people are like just kind of um, like gripping onto it because it's a very different type of erotica, yeah. right? So then when I went to do went to do my application for my PhD studies, I was like, man, screw humor because yeah. like no, that's screw humor. But like, but the actual erotica that I write is all funny, and that's like there's like some there's some nuances there that like we can get into um, as we go along. But but I wanted to focus on like how that humor and sexuality and like sensuality desire the embodiment and expressions of those desires come through in like Anishinaabe sensibility and what that means in terms of um, uh, embodying liberation like really these fleshy vessels and the musculature of liberation sitting here already just kind of waiting to be um, articulated 
And um, so I'd so, you know, within my PhD studies, which I'm still doing, like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm a doctoral candidate, I think much like yourself. Yeah, still doing my PhD um, slowly, right? but surely. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like I, I have this thing where I'll be like introducing myself. People will be talking to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm on the 10 year track. And they're like, oh, cool. 10 year track. Awesome. I'm like, no, no, the 10 year track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> minimum. Yeah. Minimum. <laughs> and um, anyhow, so I really got like a lot of. Uh, so, I, so I applied for PhD mm -hmm. at Queens, which is where I'm doing my um, doctoral work. And it's in uh, what would be called like research creation. Mm -hmm. So. On one hand, I'm like theoretically looking at the the power of um, erotica, Anishinaabe erotics in particular and intimacies, but I'm also writing about it. So I, I'm writing and producing. That's what that's why it's called research creation, because you're like creating um, some of the own some of the ways to like it's an artistic kind mm -hmm. of practice. Right. But I don't consider myself an artist. I feel like I'm just a storyteller, mm -hmm. not just a storyteller, like just real uh, diminishing <laughs> myself to self-deprecating. <laughs> <laughs> but um but that's what I feel because there's like no structure to any of my works that I do um people have referred to it as like cook and porn uh bush porn like whatever and I've had people and I do when I tell the stories I do have to code switch so that is something that I also grapple with because they just don't sound the same when they're like spoken by my like white man's voice <laughs> yeah <laughs> Because I don't like to, you know, it's I don't true. talk in yeah. the whole like Nishnabe tongue the whole time. Yeah. But I don't try to do it in a way, I'm very mindful of not doing it in a way that like also fetishizes and and makes um, makes the way that folks talk on the res absurd. Mm -hmm. I don't try to do it in a way that makes us sound like simple or mm -hmm. makes us sound, because it is very rich and it is very particular mm -hmm. to a place. True. And that yeah. place is connected to land. And that land is what makes us like who we are. So... Mm -hmm. I would never do it in a way that just sounds like a mockery. Yeah. Like or or mimicry. Um, I just try to like I just try to um articulate it in a way that also that that resonates with the way those stories the way I would have heard those stories being mm -hmm. told. Um and that was sort of a process of self-reflection too, right? And being sort of and being called out on that early. Um when I was when I would present or perform a lot of these uh works so now I've I've tempered it to a way that I feel is just sort of responsible nice legit um yeah. so yeah so so that's what, like kind of how I got into it and then throughout my PhD work just being invited to like various fora to like to um people will be like okay are you gonna do your uh your bush porn or what and I'm like yeah. damn right you know I am <laughs> like <laughs> I'll be pontificating all like up here and the people are like Man, just squash that. Can we? Can you just give us a reading? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> get to the good stuff. <laughs> just get to the good stuff. And I yeah. think that you know, I I remember one um one thing we did with Tennille Campbell, and um and uh, Erica Violet Lee at, in mm -hmm. Kingston at Queens, and we both both we all sort of read from our our works, and it was called like Tales from the Bush. And mm -hmm. some people were like, "Well, you guys aren't really from the bush." Like, well, Tennille, except for Tennille. <laughs> yeah, she's from the bush. Yeah. <laughs> Neil is the bush, <laughs> <laughs> but we had to, and yeah, being being like mindful of responding to those critiques, but at the same time being like, especially in my work, I always try to like to emphasize that while we can't appropriate the bush as a concept and as a place and as a location, that bush when we when we've embodied the bush, it comes with us. Like the bush doesn't end at the like confines of the reserve, and this is not to like invisibilize like the real struggle in everyday. Um, implications of living within the space that's confined within the bush but the bush like comes with us type of a thing right um, as we traverse but also not just yeah just being very mindful of not saying like the res comes with us or yeah that type of thing. yeah 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 there's a lot going on here I really like it like I really like how, how you're positioning this and speaking to it um, and again like even the context of you know how we speak and how we relate to one another publicly I noticed some comedians or you know some influencers they they tend to take it too far where where people are laughing at who we are yeah like they're, exactly. they're not yeah, yeah not so much the content right and, I, and then right. I, that always turned me off too obviously but then at the same time like what you're talking about in terms of even the code switching i'm having a hard time right now with the podcast voice like i think i overthought it over the summer <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is 
I'm a, I got the credit collector voice like when they call. It kicks in, right? When all of a sudden, you know, when somebody calls, all of a sudden your voice completely changes, right? right. When it's like yeah. the bill collector or right. like, and, and even for a kid, like even for me as a kid, it was so hard for me to call in even like pizza orders and stuff. Like I had to code switch to like right. obviously sound like a white person, right? And then it, it right. still comes up for me, especially even with the podcast voice because people say they like listening to the podcast. It's a good flow, you know, the, the narrations there and all this. But then for me, it's like, do I really talk? talk like that it comes it comes up even talking to you like i'm super like nervous like i don't know if it's really me is it me i don't know i really don't know i'm not i, I don't want to spend too much time overthinking it right. <laughs> but but you are talking about you know the reality of 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 what it is and how we navigate this world as indigenous people not only through the voice yeah. but even in terms of content like how we're how we're trying to engage in obviously you know um like our sexuality in general like this is something that's really important to position and like i want to take a step back and and even bring into the conversation the listeners who are still embodying like a sense of shame around yeah, even sure. you know even hearing yeah. the word Anishinaabe erotics for some people I feel maybe like oh what is that you know well right. you know the reality even in my community work like I always tell this story that I was doing community work um, delivering a program in one of the northern communities here I think in Saskatchewan or Manitoba and we were talking about family systems we were talking about kinship systems and uh, parenting and uh, you know the presence of children mm -hmm. And I remember um, the conversation came up even around sexuality and it was the grandmothers who did initiate that conversation mm -hmm. on how is it we, we expect our grandchildren to have uh, healthy relationships mm -hmm. when we don't even talk about what healthy relationships are. Mm -hmm. or, and then that applied to sexuality. And I remember one grandmother brought it up and like, how do we talk to our grandchildren about having sex in mm -hmm. terms of safe sex, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of um, a body autonomy? And I'm adding mm -hmm. those words, but she, she did sort of speak to it in that way. Mm -hmm. And I remember one, uh, one lady got really uncomfortable with it mm -hmm. in, in, in this group. And, and one of the grandmothers really had a unique way of bringing humor into the equation. And mm -hmm. she told the story about how she grew up on the trap line. And she started to recognize when she got at that age of, of, of being at that age where she recognized that babies were coming from somewhere. Right. <laughs> right. They weren't just being trapped. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And, and she, she brought it up in that way where she said, well, I remember my, my mush and my cook them going in the bush, my mom and dad going into the bush. And then a few, you know, a few months later or a few weeks later, she'd be pregnant. Right. Like the babies were coming from somewhere. Right. right? So how do we have those conversations? Right. And I remember like it really eased the tension in the room was that, you know, these babies are coming from somewhere and let's have a conversation about where they're coming right. from, how they're coming into this right. world. Because, you know, your work is, is highlighting that, that we're having conversation on sexuality, sex Actual practice relationships and kinship and and it's something that it, you know is a missing link in a lot of our conversations right. right yeah I feel that like and I feel that um I was talking to I can't remember who I was talking to recently just having a conversation about how I came to also understand like sexuality and stuff and I think for Anishinaabe people who have experienced and, and you know indigenous people in general who have experienced like generations of sexual violence it's a very tender and and sort of um, at the same time, tumultuous subject. And I feel a huge responsibility for that too. Like people ask me, how can you write in this way? And they're calling me to like, calling me in and saying, without like, without um, putting Indigenous women at harm even more, because then we're exposing more of our bodies, right? And I'll get into a little bit of like my response to that. But the one thing I always say is like, this is how I heard my aunties talk. This is how I heard my grandmother talk. This is how I heard my mother talk and then all like, you know, older cousins, older women within our communities. The ways that I'm telling these stories is actually that that voice and those accents and those like vernacular and those mannerisms and those ideas and those little quips that they would say. Right. So and I always witness the tension between how how they were in the home and with each other and like talking about sex and, you know, their their sweeties and their snags and all this and then how. The moment that they walked outside the door, they performed um, Nishnabe womanhood as a Nishnabe sexual being in a very different way. It was very like subdued. It was very like imbued with shame. It was not the same thing that I would hear in the everyday like conversations. I'd always grown up with that. I always I always tell the stories that I always grew up with my aunties and my grandmas and my mom and everybody walking around like semi naked, and it was just sort of a thing. 
like you sort of saw all different types of body shapes you'd see just you know different things I would see scars on my mother's body and I'd ask her about them and she'd explain what happened all of these like violences and you know I always had that kind of there was an openness right and in terms of viewing those bodies not as like covered and not as um, just uh, essentialized as shameful or deserving of shame but just having conversations around them right so I started going to school and I went to a Catholic school in one of these schools. And, you know, I, I don't know where, I don't know the conversation I heard in school or wherever I heard it, but then I started coming home and being like, I, I remember one time I might've been like five or six. And I told my mom, I said, mom, you're supposed to cover yourself up. Mm. And I remember saying mm. that my mom like got all like pissed off and she's like, come on, baby girl, that's the white man teaching you that. <laughs> but she didn't know how to like articulate it because that's how she grew yeah. up as well, yeah. right? Especially amongst women, right? So the women would, because I, I I didn't, we didn't, I never viewed um, men in different states of, of undress, but it was, it was always the women. Yeah. And can you give an example of the paradigm or the way our bodies as Indigenous people were maintained in practice that is drastically different than the modern world or the European world? Um, I had heard stories that people that breastfeed, people that were capable of breastfeeding would just breastfeed other people's kids, right? If, if for instance, someone couldn't, whatever, maybe they were out on the trap line, maybe they were out doing yeah. just various tasks, maybe they couldn't, right? And I think about that a lot in terms of, if you're just to suggest today that if someone's having an issue with like, with breastfeeding or producing milk or whatever it is, and someone else comes along and just says, well, I'll feed your baby, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. can you imagine kind of the reaction to yeah. that? And I started thinking about that in terms of just that um, that kinship or that closeness that has been, like, we've been so separated to a point where those things are no longer an option for us, but are really, um, really determine how we enact, how, how we enact, like, governance within our communities, how we enact closeness how we enact like survivability, like futurity is really dependent, for instance, upon folks, you know, maybe if you don't have access to formula, whatever it is, right? Um, and however you choose to, to feed your babies. But really, there's like, there's a severing of futurity when we talk about separating these bodies that would move in flux and would share um, uh, responsibilities within the community for things like breastfeeding would have breasts exposed right and again I'm I'm viewing this within a context that like is very understanding that we cannot mm -hmm. have our breasts exposed at this at this juncture because of the sexual violence and just sort of the the state that we're in but I think thinking along you know what you were what you were referring to when the grandmothers say this is just how we kind of grew up right <laughs> like this is how we came to understand like and it didn't come from that lens of shame it came from the lens of like just this is our governance this is our corporeal governance these are our kinship systems there's nothing seen as wrong between sharing something like the labor of of breastfeeding yeah that's a really good example because i do know of stories i did hear stories of that taking place where you know multiple bodies did breastfeed and nourish babies and i like how you put it in perspective of futurity ensuring futurity and taking care of children ultimately the presence of children how, can i ask how you approach this conversation because for me my example was that it was a really unsettling conversation running a group in a community uh, with grandmothers present and sort of diving into this conversation and seeing it unravel how do you go about approaching it and and what is it like to have these conversations on your end um i remember like one time i was giving one of my one of my readings and whenever elders are in the room i still get like i still get nervous <laughs> yeah I'm like oh shit right yeah. like oh man so this one elder is my son's like great great auntie she's from here from kitagon zibi and um anyways i'm telling like all these like sickening little stories <laughs> and like, I felt so bad after and I looked at her. I'm like, I'm so sorry, Auntie. I didn't mean to do it. And she's just like deadpan. She's just like, Oh, what do you think? I wasn't young once. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. Okay. God, you totally just like. <laughs> and then this other time I was telling another another reading. And of course I was like pinpoint the elders because I'm like, are they gonna come here and just like tell me off later? And like, you know, like anyways I was telling a story and nobody in the room got it like in this this one joke because there wasn't a much indigenous people in the room if there was they would have and mm -hmm. I was I, I have like a tension with with performing my 
stories in front of white people but anyways I told this thing about a coyote snag and the only person that laughed was like this old mohawk lady <laughs> I was like okay someone got it yeah. <laughs> She's like, of course I know what a coyote snag is. Jeez. <laughs> okay. 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 But yeah, I think that's what it is, right? I think I think even us as younger, um, maybe storytellers or people that are doing this work is to also not make assumptions about where um, older people and our grannies and aunties and elders are at. I think they can feel, mm, yeah. um, I, I don't want to make assumption that the work we're doing is like so like, <laughs> liberating but i feel like it, i i wonder if it could feel affirming for for like older folks in our communities to actually sort of understand where you know how how mm-hmm. they would have witnessed that sort of transformation or that change between mm-hmm. how their families and communities would talk about sex or engage in sexual activities and and different forms of intimacy and then sort of witnessing that being taken away violently and and suppressed and then now maybe this reemergence yeah i think can be special but i don't want to make assumptions for true yeah the power of our work they could just be like it's just fucking funny it doesn't have to be all political <laughs> girls <laughs> true. yeah that happens sometimes right? too yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's true and i think like you're definitely like on on viewing in terms of like how do we address this right because in my story like there was a gap like there's an obvious knowledge gap in terms of well how do we practice you know healthy intimacy how we practice healthy relationships how do we raise the next generation to be you know sexually intimate in healthy ways and in terms of like obviously with colonialism all a lot of that was removed right and then in terms of like decolonization and in your perspective anishinaabe erotics how does that inform a decolonization how is that a form of decolonization? One of the cool things and I, I kind of want to highlight also is that as Indigenous people, you know, surviving colonialism and oppression and still here, we know how white people love. Right. We know right. how their their rom-coms look. We know even, you know, how, how the relationship expectations exist for them. But then we're realizing now we're coming from a unique way of being also. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So I guess the first part is, is if I think about settler colonialism, right, it's reliant upon land and it's reliant upon the continued and ongoing occupation of our homelands. And that wasn't like a benign process. We know that there was all sorts of ways that Indigenous folks have been removed from the land, right? Whether that was just completely just plowing through them, um, whether it was these really devastating policies of removal, whether it was just straight up murder, whether it was... Um, starving people out, whether it was um, just all these ways for settler colonialism to occur and this new formation of a foreign um, government and and governing structure to to impose itself on us, right? And one of the ways that that was done, of course, was through, and then still continues to be done, is through the sort of um, violent sexual removal of um, of bodies, right? And this often occurs against women and two-spirit people, and, and of course men as well, but we we understand sort of the really uh, devastating impacts that it that it occurs like for for women. And there's a lot that go that there's a lot of like so I won't get into much of the theoretics around that, but there's a reason why that occurs, right? Um, and and there's a, there's a number of mechanisms that ensure that but that removal of our bodies from the land taking place within the specter and when in 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 relation to things like man camps that are taking place um in resource extraction and so on like that's just no coincidence that and, mm-hmm. and i'm not saying someone was sitting there all like let's create a man camp and then the women around it will but it's just a natural sort of um progression that those things would happen so all of these sort of factors that are taking place uh, with respect to um, uh, settlers being able to continue to occupy those homelands, um, there's a cessation of futurity. So the cessation of futurity um, takes place in a number of ways. And one of them is this idea of just reckoning with um, Indigenous women's bodies that that in our own communities would be seen as integral and fundamental to rebuilding and reproducing the nations. Of course, I have some critiques like in that sort of, there's some nuances to that, but within the white man's heteropatriarchal um, and really cis heteropatriarchal Vic- Victorian feminist type of thing, right? Um, it really is indigenous women who are reproducing those nations. So it comes to fore that those particular bodies have to be erased and have to be like eviscerated because 
in that lens, we're the ones who are responsible for and really at risk of of reproducing more Indigenous folks to mm-hmm. um, rise up against this foreign um, imposition. Yeah. So that's kind of like the Quill Christie Peters writes about this um, in in a uh, reflection of a painting that she did, and it's it called it's called uh, Quay becomes the moon and touches herself so she could feel whole again. And it's just this beautiful article where she's describing all of this violence that's occurred to um, Indigenous women in particular and removing us from those lands and as this priority of uh, settler colonialism. And I think, you know, we, we, a lot of theorists will will stand behind that. And she talks about like these situations or these gestures where if a person were to say, go sit at the shores of Lake Superior and pleasure themselves and engage in like in, in self-pleasure, amongst those amongst those shores maybe out in the bush kind of um on the land Mm -hmm. she's asking this question she's posing this question then does that honor our ancestors does that honor the ones who are like who have been forcefully removed from these lands not just to engage in something like reproduction right because of course we want to talk about reproductive justice uh, indigenous women not getting sterilized forcefully without their um consent uh, indigenous women being uh, sexually violated in the most harmful and, and degrading and, and um, devastating ways. But she's saying that's just sort of the basis, right? That's kind of just the fundamental right to live, right? <laughs> and have some semblance of like a future and futurity. But she raises this question of like something like self-pleasure. Then what does that so how does that fit into this schematic of like decolonization and a very specific like anti-settler colonial um de de uh, colonial praxis? Mm-hmm. And and that's something that I that I you know resonates with me a lot. It, it, at the time that she wrote this article, it's in Guts magazine. Um I was thinking a lot through this as well and sort of starting to think about how we have that sort of basic like right to exist in our own bodies, free from like violence and and those types of things. But then how do we take it a step further and enter into that realm of like um, of pleasure and and intimacies? And, you know, um, I I sort of think of it as, yeah, that's the baseline not to be violated, not to have our bodies just for the taking. Right. Like that's kind of like where we that's the starting off point. Mm -hmm. So I really think about um, decolonization in in the sense of like performing and living our bodies as really as um, liberatory praxis, right? So yes, if we could live without the sort of um, impending doom of violence occurring to us all the time, that I don't have to live in fear of being violated. Like I think of that as the most like powerful form of resistance, but I'm also like taking that, that step further where I'm allowing my body to engage with like these other senses where our impulses have been reserved to fight off violence and be wary of violence. And Sarah Ahmed writes about this a lot, how um, that fear of violence, even if someone, a woman in particular, has never experienced violence, there's an epigenetic transferal of that fear and that impulse. So uh, she'll describe that, you know, men, uh, uh, pardon me, women will just walk in public and it might be late at night and a man walks by, she'll ultimately, or she'll um, impulsively sort of tighten up and get a little wary maybe even though if she's never even experienced that violence there's just an assumption that's flowed through histories of violence against women um, that sticks with someone and this is like these epigenetic impulses that we carry so for indigenous women those would be particular types of men that would be more uh, scary than others or more impulsively um, scary than others so I think about if we're if we're sort of directing all this like affective attention towards resisting violence what if we like turn that affective attention into experiencing like joy and pleasure and how could that empower us how can that create these sort of new epigenetic um memories for for our people for ourselves and i think that um i think about joy a lot i think about decadence like there's there's an idea that of course i'm like you know i'm bougie but like i'm also like i have I have some like uh, alignment with like anti-capitalist like sensibilities, right? But I also think that there has to be room for joy and decadence for Indigenous folks because that might have looked mm, different like yeah. prior to colonization. Mm-hmm. But joy doesn't necessarily have to be like material accumulations. Yeah. Joy could be like the um, 
assembling of like just multiple experiences, multiple flashpoints, multiple points of pleasure that could feel very um, decadent and don't necessarily result in like material like gain where you're gaining or where you're um, benefiting from the accumulation of those experiences um, is more um, spiritual maybe. Yeah, I really like how you highlighted that too. And then like the, one of the things that's coming up for me too is one of the exercises I do in some of my community work working with groups is is where we identify collective joy. Mm. And when we identify collective joy, we realize that the collective joy we experience today socially in terms of kinship, in terms of family, in terms of food, is the same collective joy our ancestors yeah, experienced. Totally. Yeah. There's like, it's not much different, right? Yeah. That's why we love KFC as Native people, because it's a collective food, right? right? We all sit there on the bucket of chicken to eat it, right? right? And it's like family oriented. So that's naturally why in my mind, like why Natives love KFC. It's, right. it's like, and it was, what's interesting about that is we don't necessarily make fried chicken in our households we'll make fry bread right? but the kfc bucket the yeah. decadence of it right going to town and experiencing yeah. that is all part of that collective right. joy and we had that in the past around eating yeah. around feasting around sharing food right so this 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 process or this aspect of reclaiming my my like my, my visceral body my physical yeah, body exactly. that i'm going to allow yeah. myself to feel this and embrace this it does give yeah. me kind of shivers right because yeah. you we are liberating ourselves from shame Right. Yeah. And yeah. In terms of like, you know, residential school, in terms of colonialism, yeah. in terms of colonization. And, and that's where I'm at in my journey, too, is like trying to identify what is, you know, what am I in terms of my healthy sexuality? What am I in terms of who I am and where my collective joy is? Because, you know, yeah. me obviously being a cis hetero, you know, normative male, it does exist for me. Um, and, and it is something that I have to navigate and I'm trying to navigate consciously as right. even as a father now right in terms of trying yeah. to create a, a collective joy household right yeah oh i love that just this it, household of collective joy yeah and yeah. it's 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 really hard for me right because honestly like you know there is like emotions that come up and we're navigating colonization and colonialism but like for me like to speak from it from my perspective around joy and and uh and even like um decadence like for me one of my greatest joys in life as an indigenous male is watching my daughters eat <laughs> right oh, <laughs> because they're being nourished so right? right and i'm really like yeah. tapping into that and then on the next level of that like to take it deeper watching them eat traditional foods from our territory right it's like right yeah, yeah. that's like a ultimate yeah. joy like a gratefulness and then right. on the next level it's watching them eat traditional foods i harvested oh right? it's like that meme. <laughs> it's that meme where he's like starts out like this and as it goes bigger than the end your like head explodes <laughs> yeah yeah like oh boom right right yeah it's yeah. it's it's very real and then like that that's so tied to place that's so tied to our identity our land-based practice and and for me that's yeah. like joy and and then when i navigate and think about it from that perspective well then what limits me from that while well, it's settler yeah. colonialism it's right. colonization yeah. Right. And it's it's yeah. literally like, you know, the things we deal with. But now I'm positioning that joy as the reason why I want to resist, as the reason right. why I want to push back against center colonialism. And that's just right. an example. That's a safe example. That's a safe right. example for me to talk about. I just can't. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. But that's an example of how, you know, these practices right. of not feeling shame, not basing ourselves in shame and, you know, pleasure, joy, decadence and reclaiming our body, our sense of love is very real. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. Like, I think um, what's missing are those that feeling that we're deserving of joy. Right. And and I think that what we've gone through and what we've endured has left us feeling that we're deserving of violence. Right. Or that we're and maybe mm. not deserving of violence, mm. but that we're that it's um, that it's uh, inevitable mm. that, that violence is inevitable. But yeah. how can we switch it to be like this joy? Joy is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I think about that a lot in terms of um, intimacy. So a lot of my, my work is on intimacy. And I think about intimacy as a governing structure. Right. Um, as our sort of the ties that bind and 
a few years ago as I was in sort of maybe like my coursework, um, you know how all over Facebook there's like these Cree word of the day or like Nishnabe word of the day, mm-hmm. Ojibwe word of the day. And one of my like, I, I love this artist and friend, Dana Danger. Um, uh, Soto, I believe in Métis. I'm sorry if I messed that up, but uh, um, you know, asked posed the question because of course their work deals with all of that, and they're into like kink and BDSM and and as this artistic practice and and sort of combining it with our traditional um, paradigms, right? And um, they just asked a question on this like um, Anishinaabe word of the day or Ojibwe word of the day. They're like, how would how would what's a word for intimacy? Because I, I I feel like they were developing like a show or something like that. And um, people, of course, I'm sure you can imagine some of the responses, right? And it's like, by and large, I found this so fascinating. They were like, we don't have a word for that. And I found this really like interesting because they're like, we didn't have a word for intimacy, right? Oh, Nishnabe's, like it was that puritanical sense, mm. ability that came yeah. through. Even aspects of like noble savagery, right? It sh- tends to show up like, oh, we're spiritual beings. We don't do that. Right. And like just the um, non-desexualized context of our language. Right. So maybe within an English um, like viewpoint. Yeah. Anishinaabe's maybe didn't have that word for for quote unquote intimacy. But that's but out of all the responses, people are like, we didn't have a language like that. The language sacred, whatever. Right. And all of these things. So finally, someone comes forth and some people did have some suggestions and someone someone came forth and said the way that we would say it where I'm from is uh, and Dana asked, well, what does that mean, right? And the person responded back, it means the closeness of the Nishnabek. Now, the, the how this ties into like my work is the person that responded is my cousin who um, used to learn the language from my grandfather. That was his uncle. Uh, my grandfather was his uncle and he would, he knew the language, like that's mm-hmm. what they all spoke in, in the home, but he told me later, he's like, I used to love going to visit your grandfather because he would tell me the Gull Bay. Like, you'd hear things like from surrounding communities. He's like, but then I'd go talk to your grandfather and he would have all the Gull Bay specific like dialect. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother was fluent as well, but mm-hmm. my grandfather was known as like the linguistic kind of king in the um, area, like literally king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... the last name. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. So I asked him because I was like, this is really interesting. Like, what do you mean about that? And I took it offline. Like, I was just because he's my cousin. So I was just texting him. I said, I saw you. You responded to my friend. Like, what do you mean about that? What do you mean about that closeness? And he's like, I don't know. He goes, that's just what I would think, like, based on our community and like how how your friend was asking what does intimacy mean? He, he's like, in my view, in my mind, as an Anishinaabe person, that's what it means, that closeness. Mm-hmm. And I was and I was fascinated. I had to sit down with it for like a couple of days. And that really um is almost like uh now a methodology for my work is that like the Bashindam Nishnabek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it almost like flies in the face of Western value systems around individualism, right? The whole project of settler colonialism, capitalism, all relies upon like liberalism, individual individualism, right? And that liberal kind of sensibility that takes bodies away from one another for whatever formation is required in order to um, facilitate the the um, um, the capitalist like whatever yeah. regime right if you want for to sure say. yeah so I started thinking about like closeness and I started really thinking through how all of these systems and how all of these um, mechanisms really are about driving Nishnabek apart in order to like facilitate that ongoing land occupations. So I also started thinking about at that time, um, you know, how do we bring bodies back together? Because in in thinking through that, I was like, how do we have that like sort of spiritual connection as well if our bodies are driven so far apart? Yeah. Um, So I started thinking through intimacies as like, um, of course, being like loving towards one another, having really loving words towards one another. And I started thinking about how do we get our bodies back in flux? How do we get our bodies to under to to recognize each other's spirit again? And I completely understand that things like touch, intimacy, uh, closeness is very, very. We have to view it through like a trauma informed lens, mm-hmm. and very specifically an indigenous trauma informed lens. Mm, yeah. But how do we facilitate those bodies coming back together? Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I like how you positioned it in terms of obviously like collective joy, right? We talked about that, but now you're getting into more of the immediate personal space around intimate relationships. And I guess that's going to get into the conversation around um, monogamy and, and uh, ethical non-monogamy, right? Um, so how does that sort of come into play in terms of your work and your thought process? So I started thinking about like um, non-monogamy and I think about monogamy in terms of how that really at the end of the day just upholds the capitalist state, the structure of the state, so that um, bodies are non-threatening, formations of families are non-threatening to that structure, um, that there's a, there's a security and there's a rigidity to the assumption that families are going to be formed in a certain way or, or assemblages of people and communities and kin are going to be formed in such a way that doesn't threaten the will of that regime and that structure, um, which also points to how uh, feeble it is or how like uh, weak it is if it mm. has to rely upon the constant like yeah. um, enforcement of formation of, of these bodies, like political bodies and real physical mm -hmm. bodies. So I started thinking about things like non-monogamy as um, also something that is um, um, how would you say it? Like Anishinaabe sensibility. Yeah, like a sensibility in terms of that. Like it made sense, right? And and we did have obviously, you know, different family structures and relationship structures in some tribes, right? In a lot of tribes, actually. Um, but I could see definitely where you're going in terms of how the Western state and colonialism wanted these monogamous nuclear families to operate and be defined in such a way in terms of household, right? Because obviously, as a collective people, uh, there's stories and oral histories, obviously, around how we had social relationships, kinships, and even multiple partnerships at certain points in time. And yeah, it, I guess I could ask you, like, how how is this useful? Like, how is it such a different paradigm than what we're used to today in a Western settler colonial world? I think about I think about how non monogamy, um, ethical non monogamy, of course, and consensual non monogamy, mm, yeah. is a very powerful um, um, paradigm. And there's something um, within like kind of the poly kind of culture and community that talks about compersion. Have you ever heard of that? Compersion? No, I don't think I have. Okay. So it's kind of like if you're in a in a poly structure and you have like multiple partners or whatever, it's this feeling that one partner will get when they witness their other partner experiencing joy with someone else, whether they like witness it firsthand or if they hear about it, if a partner comes back and says, I had this great time with this person and, you know, this is what I felt or or they witnessed it themselves. And it's like this notion that you could feel joy and you could feel happy mm for somebody that you love feeling love mm -hmm. and that love kind of like resonates as this like binding factor. And that's where you um, experience that joy. It's not through the limitation of perhaps a structure, a monogamous structure that uh, presupposes that you're going to experience joy within that like union and that structure. It, the joy actually comes from the relational interactions that the people that you love have with other people. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's a really interesting paradigm to be to think about, right? And I can see how it's really unsettling for people also. Like it's even unsettling for me to a certain extent. So so I mean, I guess we could bring this back to to you specifically is is how did this thought process um unfold for you? Like how were you thinking about this and going about understanding this? I you know, I I sat on that for a while because of course there's like things like jealousy and <laughs> Yeah. Different, different like theories of attachment mm -hmm. and all of this types of things mm -hmm. but I really like started to um, reflect upon how it was a matter of scarcity and how uh, and how indigenous folks well, first nations folks because I can't really speak for everybody mm -hmm. uh, Anishinaabe folks uh, would it would have experienced intimacy differently than me which would have been a scarcity of intimacy if they had attended uh, residential schools for instance mm -hmm. yeah or the overabundance of a really degrading and awful violent type of intimacy, right? Yeah. So the actual like true core of experiencing joy and intimacy was that way of feeling joy um, for others. It was it was erased because of just like all of these things that were happening. So if we go back to the breastfeeding breastfeeding scenario. If I wasn't able to breastfeed and someone came along and said, "Okay, yeah, I'll breastfeed your baby," I would feel joy for my child 
receiving like nourishment and and what have you I would feel joy for that person feeling good about feeling feeding another child's baby I wouldn't necessarily I don't think I would have felt in those structures jealousy hmm. Interesting. that my baby's like you know what I mean yeah so when I apply that to like a situation of today of um the way that the limitations of intimacy joy um love desire pleasure was either really ugly or it wasn't apparent or it wasn't there <laughs> at all and how do we kind of reintroduce things um you know in that scarcity and i know that you know um i know that these are super difficult conversations right <laughs> yeah folks totally to think, totally yeah to think through but i really think of it as a powerful way um and um to start to address it i'm not saying that everybody just has to start like having polygamous or non-monogamous relationships these are things that folks can, <laughs> like, sure. explore but it shouldn't be what's compulsory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there are folks that just feel completely like good and fine in a mon monogamous relationship that's like totally mm -hmm. cool right yeah but it's if it was enforced upon them then we have to think about or if it was forced upon them mm -hmm. we have to think about whether that's a good um situation for for folks to like um be in mm -hmm. but there has to be that option of of say non monogamy in order i think to um really honor where folks are at like i, I saw something on facebook one time or maybe instagram they're just like imagine being told you can only love one of your children imagine being told you can only love like one of your parents imagine being told that all your kids can only love one parent like there's all of these sorts of things yeah and it's like you have to ask yourself why is that the expectation within an intimate mm -hmm. adult you know um um romantic pleasurable sexual marriage union whatever it is like why is that the expectation yeah and really what it like boils down to is that structure of the nuclear family that upholds the will of a very violent state yeah totally like the state itself and the state of like capitalism mm -hmm. so yeah those are just some of the things that keep me awake at night <laughs> <laughs> there yeah there's definitely truth to this and there's definitely like inquiry that that we need to make collectively as indigenous people because we do know that polyamorous situations existed like dynamics yeah, that exist sure. you know pre-contact yeah. and, and yeah. naturally they would um and like even the the example of love you gave it's almost like even for me you know uh helping raise two daughters from two different territories like i don't have the assumption or the presumed assumption that they're going to have to love one territory territory more than the other oh that's true. yeah i've never thought about that yeah 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 for sure like yeah. it extends even into landscape right it, 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 it there's extensions of this conversation yeah and and i feel like we have this social structure of monogamy and the upholding of monogamy or the practices Absolutely. of monogamy being really yeah impactful yeah, totally. like in positive and negative ways like there's a lot of negative stories about sure, yeah. monogamy in terms of yeah. family breakup in terms of turmoil in communities yeah. and that's why i feel like you know certain aspects of monogamy and practices of it is a very yeah. forced western construct that a lot of our people struggle with yeah. And it's everywhere. Like it shows up in the media, like monogamy shows up in the media, white monogamy shows up in the media, uh, you know, fantasy, romantic, uh, fairy tale monogamy shows up in the yeah, media. Totally. Um, and it's ingrained and it's force fed yeah. to us culturally, like socially. Yeah, uh, seeing it in on Disney, right? I'm still torn as a father about Disney because you know my analytical mind kicks in and things like that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there like obviously conversations around joy, right? my girls love disney yeah. and and yeah like we're, we're really ingrained to really um I, I wouldn't say necessarily yeah. limit our existence but yeah. construct and operate from assumptions that joy is going to come from these practices when we look at the social dynamics in our community in my mind you know monogamy Absolutely. and you know un untruthful conversations yeah. or yeah, even non-consensual totally. um conversations around like what is um acceptable sure. and not yeah. acceptable does cause a lot yeah. of damage like it does cause a lot of damage yeah. like even monogamy in some cases does cause a lot of damage because there is shame there right and it does fester yeah. it does leave to toxic dynamics so yeah these conversations they are very unsettling yeah. like you know even for me reflecting on it in my life and in my past and even take it into my future now it's like well how am i going to choose to love and structure my life safely like in a sense of knowing who i am 
and safe, secure relationships. And you pointed out that, you know, it can be very limiting. I think it is like, I mean, just one example, if you think about two spirit folks that are, have had to live in same sex um, relationships, right? Because the expectation, and it's not even the expectation, it's so ingrained in society. And like, whether that's religion, the state, like you said, like popular culture, entertainment, but also the dynamics of the state. Um, now things are sort of changing, but like, you know, a same, a same gendered or same sex a uh, couple couldn't get the health um, benefits or, or death benefits at one time like and sort of those sorts of things are changing but you see how that like assumption of monogamy is codified so it's not just a benign thing where it's like mm-hmm. oh, what are you talking about and it's like no 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 no, no. this is like monogamy is like yeah. really uh, um, a mechanism of the state to it to assure itself to assure its own like longevity mm. and um yeah, yeah, like it, it definitely like does have like a state-based assumption of marriage, nuclear family, um, ensuring property transfer, right? Like we could go back and talk about Europe in terms of like ensuring male heirs, right? You had to practicing chastity for that. Uh, and of course, you know, people have their own um, a body autonomy to decide what they want to do with their bodies today. And I encourage that. But at the same time, it's it, there is very real measurable problems in terms of how certain aspects of our lives emerge in our psyche that weren't necessarily there before. And I don't want to minimize the fact that love exists, that we love people, that we love our partner, that we love our partners, right? That there is love there for these people that is very real and very legitimate, like very emotionally real. And this conversation doesn't minimize love at all. Yeah, I think about things like love, right? So if I'm just expected to love um, one partner, for instance, um, um, what does that mean for uh, 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 as I'm traveling and I meet a lot of people and I have a lot of friends and a lot of relationships, when someone's hurting, for instance, and needs just like tender care and like affection, a hug, you mm-hmm. know, consensual, of course, anything, yeah. a massage, like whatever that is. But mono- the 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 force of monogamy and jealousy and everything that's like um, considered appropriate of me as a as a individual within a pre existing relationship mm-hmm. kind of um, limits my or, or really severs my ability to enter into a, a healing or a, um, a responsible relationship with someone that I encounter that's hurting that like is in need of like my affection and not just mine I'm just saying affection in general but I'm the one that's there (laughs) yeah yeah. affection or joy or like cuddling or like anything like that but monogamy is so strong that I have to tell somebody that I have a relationship with whether they're a friend a colleague a confidant whatever no because within the specter of um, the white Euro Western ways that bodies are supposed to interact with one another. It's not appropriate for me to like spend a night hugging you, even though you're like really needing that right now. Like to me, that doesn't that doesn't uh, align with who I know how to be as an Anishinaabe. Like, and I'm not saying that there's like some Anishinaabe scroll somewhere where they're like, go cuddle everyone when they're feeling bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it's that notion that I have a responsibility to behave in a certain way out of care. Um, and concern uh, for for others, right? And that's the land too, like the land, other people, other beings, other um, other uh, animated and spirited um, and non-animated and spirited people. So I really have those, mm-hmm. like, I've had those types of, I guess, tensions for a while where the imposed compulsory monogamy actually limits my ability to be a good Nishnabe to like other people, to, to folks that need something or maybe just want to right just want to have joy and pleasure and whatever that is in a moment because it helps like imbricate themselves in this broader sense of corporeal liberation spiritual liberation um romantic liberation like whatever it is so that's where i see this power where you know 15 years ago i would have been like oh shit no that's like probably not appropriate but now it's just like what if that's like my gift what if that's like and not just mine like but other people's gift and then is that where that uh, Nishnabek actually occurs because that that closeness and that intimacy of the Nishnabek that brings us back together kinship wise like politically spiritually socially um and in a governance 
and economically, like whatever way, we can't do that if our bodies continue to be separated. This is my is my sort of theory, anyways. Yeah, and it it, it does give us a lot to think about. It really does give us a lot to think about. Even in me in this conversation, it, it is giving me a lot to think about. And of course, obviously, ethically and consensually having these conversations, um, because out there we do know there's very damaging practices. There's exactly. very unethical yeah. practices that do cause trauma and do cause a lot of turmoil in our communities. But then at the same time, why is there a limitation on not being able to speak honestly and truthfully around, you know, certain um, choices that, that we as human beings, as yeah. human beings on this earth, uh, can make? And then also having the autonomy and the safety to, to experience and pursue that, right? Like to experience and pursue that. Because one of the big things for like monogamy that comes up, I find in terms of my community work, my life, my past, is the concept of ownership. Yes, exactly, exactly. Right, and it does tie into the the Western European concept of like property, yeah. right? And it does have religious undertones around, you know, yeah. um, even Christianity, right? That that you know, property has to be measured, has to be protected. So you have to, you know, yeah. marry in this way. And again, it, the states right. involved in that, like the European state, was always involved in in their marriages. Had to be married in the church, right? And so all these undertones do exist, and it's it's really tough to navigate. Um, right. Really tough to navigate, and and then it even it it does trigger me too, even from the perception of ownership, right? Like for example, like like well, well, this isn't like me, but like I wouldn't be mad if somebody was choosing to feed my daughter like a moose they shot. You yeah, know what exactly. I mean? But then if you really get into like how ownership in these systems is applied, well, then that's not a far reach under like a Western system of ownership, right? right? That only I will feed my yeah. girls or only I do this. And that shows up in property. That shows that's up exactly in how households yeah. work, right? Not even wanting to share food yeah. in some cases, right? Like some people won't even want to share food. Yeah. I don't know if you saw on Twitter, but people were critiquing one of those Nordic countries in terms of um, they don't feed guests. Okay. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah, and it's like sort of like, I don't know, whatever culture they did established yeah. around that. But then like for me, when I saw that, I was like, that's so weird. Like, why wouldn't you invite somebody to eat at the table with right. you? Right, you know yeah. I mean? like, because yeah, yeah. that is a form of, again, collective yeah. joy, sharing. Yeah. Right. So like the I, I definitely feel and sense and observe like a paradigm clash that extends into the conversation of relationships, yeah. right? Around polyamory, monogamy, mm -hmm. and these conversations. And they are very unsettling conversations to have. No, they can totally be, right? And I think that, yeah, ownership's a huge thing. Like, and I and I think about that, like even, you know, with, with um, where I'm at, and it's like, how could I like justifiably or feel good about limiting, again, the people that I love, their ability to feel joy? I think there's also like a superiority um, that comes along with thinking that your partner or whoever you're engaged with at any moment in time will find ev will will uh, meet that you will meet every single need that like or desire or want or like facet of pleasure and joy is can be embodied by one person. Yeah, and that does show up in toxic ways too, right? Like in the concept of wealth, like people want to marry somebody who's wealthy to meet their physical materialistic needs and everyone's broke right now, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of struggles financially in terms of um, households, right? And not everyone has yeah. a dual income household. And so there's struggles on that front in terms of like people literally not being able to care for one another financially under a capitalist system. And, and that has very real implications. Right. And right, yeah, yeah, so like, why would there be a dynamic of superiority or control when people are just simply trying to survive? It's it's it doesn't make sense. And it, and we need to address it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, that's all I think about, too. I think that's a very like, um, it's a it's a notion of superiority that 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 one person and then, and then there's a lot of pressure on that, too. Right. Like, I personally feel a lot of pressure feeling that if I have to like meet the maybe abundant needs of another person fully and it's like no let's share the load like this is actually like this should be a communal thing there may be yeah. days where there's honestly days where I'm I also have ADHD and I have so many things going on that the simplest of conversations can feel very 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 overwhelming for me and I can't meet the need of say my partner or partners whatever it is right like I can't meet it in that particular moment because of just where I'm at 
And how like loving and generative can it be to be like, I can't do this for you right now, but like, feel free to like <laughs> meet that need. And I like, I apologize. I can't do it. Hmm. And I think about how um, powerful, like we can make ourselves by having those, those moments where we don't feel um, maybe, yeah, just limited by, by those expectations. Yeah. And, and this is why I did want to have a conversation around polyamory and I guess like the assumptions of monogamy that exists in society under a capitalist system in particular, because it is draining, it is tiring. And it does explore avenues of community in general, like creating a community, creating a collective, um, because everyone lives in these nuclear families in different households. And that's not sustainable in my perspective as an indigenous person, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it does open yeah, up the door absolutely. to have these conversations for sure. Yeah. Um, and then also, like, I want to definitely have a conversation for our listeners in terms of um, like consensual non-monogamy, right? The fact that consent's a big part of this, that um, it's done ethically, right? Because we all have stories of, you know, people who slide into the DMs and there's a lot of secrecy. But I find that, like a lot of that's rooted in shame. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and even like shame around like even trauma, like past trauma, right? Like even the dynamics of not being able to yeah. say no, not to keep your, not able to keep yourself safe or keep distance, right? Which is a problem that existed for me in my past. Yeah. Um, but this is why, like, I wish I did have more open conversations around relationships, sexuality, Absolutely. polyamory, monogamy, consensual yeah. non-monogamy, yeah. younger totally. to give myself tools to be able to survive and navigate, and ultimately keep for myself sure. and yeah. others safe right yeah. and that's partly why i want to start fostering these conversations if we don't then it's leading to very toxic yeah. dynamics it's leading to very um hurtful dynamics it's leaving yeah. leading to familial breakdown community breakdown breakdown of families and i feel like we have too many social scripts and assumptions out there on how to break families apart and we don't have enough yeah, totally. tools and scripts yeah that keep families mm -hmm. together in a trauma-informed approach in a way that is meaningful in a way that is fostering yeah. healthy kinships healthy relationships open openness trust and honesty uh because yeah there is a lot of toxicity and a lot of damaging uh things taking place right now out there yeah it totally is leading to but it's like yeah and i, I saw something too one time where they're like the the um number or whatever would you call it the frequency of like uh divorce and cheating would actually go significantly down if people could just be their true selves mm. and that's what i always focus on too it's not that like it's just the sort of free for all and everybody's just going to be like doing yeah. whatever they want there are a lot of like boundaries there are a lot of um, notions mm -hmm. of like negotiations there, there's a constant checking in on consent like hey are we still mm -hmm. good like what's kind of going on yeah. here or like what's what's sort of you know there's there's a lot of negotiations and there's a lot of things that have to go on in the in the um specter of ethical uh non-monogamy right and in terms of not hurting people um and things like that and I and that's what I always that's what I always sort of emphasize is that it's not polyamory uh, or ethical non-monogamy either one of them as like um doing away with like the family structure that like you know mm -hmm. um people are at risk because now everybody's not having kids like whatever these like assumptions are it is actually it's so much more powerful to have those yeah. really um to, to allow people to uh live that the way the way that they're meant to live and and i've been reading doing some sort of um i guess research or whatever reading up on um like the individuals that engage in ethical um non-monogamy and and polyamory just have a real feeling that they have so much more to kind of give they have so much more to like like um offer they have so much more um uh, bandwidth to enter into those conversations all the time and it's not just this notion of oh i just want to go kind of like be with who i want to be with and stuff like that which is also okay right <laughs> but once you enter into that realm mm -hmm. anyways i'm kind of i'm kind of rambling <laughs> there but yeah, yeah i think that if there is less shame around having those really difficult and unsettling conversations like how do you bring up to for instance if you have if you've had a partner for years bring up to them hey i'm interested in exploring something else or i feel like this is really me or i feel that you know i think that 
yeah, there's just a ton of kind of shame, stigma around that. There's a lot of like misunderstanding, but I feel that, yeah, I feel it could be, I feel it could be really generative and powerful. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And that, that's definitely my learning space right now is exploring that, thinking about that, because I, I even know people in my life who could have benefited from conversation around, or conversations around ethical nominee, right? you know what I mean, or, <laughs> or polyamory. And, and now they have all these stigmas right. and labels attached to them for that lifestyle, mm-hmm. which is not fair in my mind. Like they could have approached things or been, you know, had more freedom to explore in a way that was, um, that wouldn't have had those labels attached yeah. to them. You know yeah. what I mean? And, 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 and that, that kind of, it, it kind of struck the chord with me because there are even, you know, men and women in my life who, who do have those stigmas yeah. attached to them, but they're not that right. right. Because they stepped out at a time that wasn't appropriate or wasn't consensual. Yeah. And that's why we did identify consent as being a big part of this conversation. Right. But also there's these labels tied to people now, right? Like one of the ones I have issues with yeah. that I don't like being used in terms of people I know is this concept of a okay, home record. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. People being someone being called a home record, they destroyed a home, a family. If we did apply like ethical, ethical non-monogamy and, and polyamory to those conversations, um, then... Could the home not be better? Right? Yeah, could the home not be better? And then why did the home have to be wrecked then? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. like no, that's the big thing is yeah. I feel like there's social con- con- contracts that we have when you hear yeah. like a couple breaking up or you hear, you know, of these dynamics unfolding. I feel like some of our people just go into like, the conflict phase, you know, the shame right. phase. And it, yeah. they just resort to it because they don't have the conversation or the skills or the resources to approach things in another way or, you know, sit down and say, well, what's really going on here? What are the needs that aren't being met right now? And then how yeah. do we have a conversation exactly. around this? Yeah. So, yeah. And I and yeah. I see it too, like working in community, that there is a lot of fallout from unethical non-monogamy, like non-consensual yeah. non-monogamy yeah. And, and the breakdown of monogamy overall, right? But the reality for me yeah. that really bugs me is that we naturally do have blended families to begin with in some cases yeah we totally do like all like yes yeah do. yeah That's it's like, all over the place yes. a lot of families are blended right and to the point where you know children have multiple dads and they have multiple moms and that already exists in our social kinship right our aunties are our moms and our uncle are our dads so it's like we got to connect these dots because yeah it already does exist all over in our communities no it totally is right like and i feel that yeah i just feel that so i feel like like the conversation has to be had. It's a difficult conversation. It's oftentimes things that um, people don't want to hear. Um, but partic- in particular, we have to be very mindful that a lot of that, those notions of ownership, while we're talking about them, like we, they've been imbricated in us and sort of like um, built up in us. And, and we yeah. accept them as naturalized and normalized and a part of like just the True. state of being for, for humans mm-hmm. type of a thing. Mm-hmm. And then the trauma informed lens, right? Like that's very, very, very important. So folks that have like anxious attachment styles due to their, their trauma, mm-hmm. polyamory is not necessarily going to be like a good choice for them at that time. They could, like mm-hmm. anxious attachment, um, paranoid attachment that can, that can be worked through, uh, you know, but, it, but they're, they're, there has to be some motivation to work through that. So no, at that point in time. So so again, even thinking of non-monogamy and polyamory um, as uh, an option or as an alternative, I guess, to, to monogamy has to be done through a very delicate trauma-informed approach too, right? Because then we don't want to be the ones like shaming either, right? So true. I think yeah. that there has to be a lot of, um, and they can happen like uh, congruently, you know, or, or concurrently, sorry, not congruently, like they can happen uh, concurrently right that state of healing that has to occur in order for something like experiencing joy with multiple partners or experiencing pleasure in different situations and, and different temporal kind of um, spaces yeah yeah this all makes sense like you're really laying it out and giving us a lot to think about and then one of the other like unique dynamics when I think back on working in indigenous communities and even observing you know, my family systems and my extended family systems is that there is still like underlying degree of right. love for yeah. one another, even yeah. when it does lead to extended families or blended families or children's uh, parents, like their other parent and their family systems. Like there is a communal love aspect. And and we hear this, like like over here, we hear this from our old people, like you have to love one another, you have to get along, you have to look out for one another. And there's this underlying 
degree, like I said, of, of this, this companionship, this kinship, and this communal looking after of one another, despite, you know, the differences and the challenges that we face. And working with families, like, you know, in terms of even family breakdown, you often tend to hear, like, even, you know, grandparents or parents of of the other family say, well, well, I still have love for so-and-so, or right. I still love them. Yeah. And then for me, that's more indigenous yeah. than than the toxicity that existed oh, in those, sure. in the fa- yeah. family falling apart, you know? Yeah. And, and so it's like, oh, we notice totally. these things, and it's definitely like these missing puzzle pieces. <laughs> but right. and these no, conversations totally. kind of allow us to navigate and fill those those puzzle pieces with with something that that could potentially work to to create healthy families and healthy communities and healthy kinships yeah i think so yeah yeah like if you think of the pressures that for instance alone a single lone parent faces if there's not another partner involved like another parent involved whatsoever they're dealing with the day-to-day they're kind of dealing with whatever it is, racism, they're dealing with maybe just all sorts of things, right? And then that like resentment starts to starts to build, um, you know, perhaps like just certain tumultuous situations occur in the home. But that's because it's that assumption under the liberal individualistic, like, like framework, right? Or that rubric, whereas if the sort of um, Nishinaabe kinship, maybe Nihayo kinship structures were, were reinvigorated, where that individual would not have to feel completely like um responsible for that for that family structure so whether that looked like two for instance single mothers um living together sharing the load right what would sort what any sort of um relationship that they were entered into two families sharing the load we know right now that it's like impossible for folks to buy a home whatever if that's if that's someone's goal right so polyamory or ethical non-monogamy can respond to a lot of those like complications i think that end up you know um just resulting in in other traumas yeah yeah i definitely could see that and and that's a concern for me with you know working with people and observing my people and the fact is is we never did things alone like we never did things alone there was really no such thing as single moms and single dads in terms of raising children it was a community thing and we do know these kinships existed we do know there was extended kinships and family systems and relationships yeah, no, they totally did. It's just like communal, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, and then what? Like, and then on the flip side of that too, I guess, like around monogamy, is that there there is like this domestication of roles. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, and that that always bugged me yeah. as a male. Right, is that men? You you got to do this, or this is you got to you know work the nine to five, and, and in a capitalist system, of course, you're not going to yeah. spend time with your children. Yeah. Then no, totally. Yeah, the domesticite domestication. Domesticization. No, totally. Um, and uh, yeah, I think about that. Like I think about how Nishnabe, um just sensibilities make pave the way for really safe. You, earlier um, on, you mentioned that these relationships always have to be safe and consensual, right? But at the core of that is always consent and responsibility. Yeah, and and that extends to all relationships. That extends throughout monogamy, right? And that's probably why I wanted to have this episode with you. Is obviously I've been reading some literature, some people's work out there, and there's a lot of useful tools in the polyamory conversation, the consensual non-monogamy conversation, Mm -hmm. that are useful, right? That people could utilize. And it's not what people think it is. It's not what people think it is for real. Like to have these unsettling conversations and to to sit in this and, and think about these things and really navigate it. Like there are literal tools here that 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 we yeah. can utilize to to create safe spaces, to create healthy relationships. And that's the goal. Like that's the goal for me is to have a collective joy process with the people I love yeah. in my family system, yeah. on my land, in my territory, resisting and, and fighting yeah. colonialism wholeheartedly. Yeah. I, so I want to ask a question. So what are some, like for our listeners out there who are having this conversation for the first time or hearing it, who are kind of tripping out right now, <laughs> what, <laughs> they're like, damn, Radical Narrative just came out straight up with like a conversation <laughs> that, that that is like, yeah, if, if we're throwing you a curveball, um, what are some ways that like practical steps people could take to begin to, you know, dive into this conversation and to think about these things? Don't do what I did. No, it's true. <laughs> Um, you know, I think you you mentioned this early or earlier is just to like sort of be authentic, right? And I mm-hmm. think that there are a lot of and and to really come to terms with um, with maybe those feelings that you have, 
right? Yeah. And I feel that it's cultivating um, spaces within ourselves to to grapple with, like, why am I feeling this way? Like, like why why do I have these impulses or urges? Mm-hmm. And to start to, um, I, I know for myself, there's no way I could have had these conversations with certain people in my life, right? There's just no way it would have it would have likely resulted in in violence, really, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that, you know, the first step is that I had to like sort of, I, if I'm just speaking for myself, I had to make sense of what these thoughts and urges and impulses were and try to really think about them outside of the paradigm of anything that was going on around me. Like, could this just be, um, you know, a thought impulse um, and uh, urge, I guess, that I have. Mm-hmm. And then I guess I'd have, I have, I myself had to seek out others that were like, like-minded, um, fine, kind, and and non-judgmental, and um, trustworthy uh, folks and and groups of people that we could sort of flesh these things out and talk about them. Um, and mm-hmm. and I don't want to like I'd never give this sort of blanket statement of oh don't be ashamed don't do this because I realize that if if you even say for some folks this is like it can incite so much harm and violence mm-hmm. to them. Um, but I think that there are avenues that, you know, can be taken to, to start to, to think about that and then practicing it when we just sort of talked about this, but practicing these principles, the principles of pleasure and consent and safety in the everyday, Mm. like interactions that you have with, with other people. So that over time, and, and this is sort of like the idea of how maybe you get over, for instance, um, anxious attachment or trauma, trauma bonds that you might have Mm. with other people people based on like what's happened to you or what's happened to your people is just that everyday practice of of um um articulating those those principles that'll eventually kind of build up a resistance or not a resistance a resilience Mm -hmm. to um those outside forces that tell you that this is wrong that that sort of um that uh make you embody that shame and make you maybe even act out the embodiment of that shame against others and so on. So I think it's a long process, I think, for a lot and I'm a lot of people, and I'm still very cognizant that particularly in many First Nations, that this is not a process that is easily kind of um, undertaken. But I think that uh, that practice of the everydayness of, of um, consent, safety, security, and um, uh, mindful pleasure, points of pleasure, mm-hmm. can then like build up a resilience to then being able to explore how to enact it. Um, but I think, I think it is doing our best to come to terms with what we're feeling and yeah. as much as we can view that from a point of pureness and a point, a point of like authenticity. And that if we could go back to even what Quil, uh, Christy Peters was saying was that this is our creator given right to like, mm. to be who we are on our lands. This is respecting mm-hmm the lands and these territories and our ancestors who who've endured so much based on that assumption that we're essentialized simple like one-dimensional beings and to flatten that I think does a disservice to um to what our people have gone through Mm -hmm. so being very tentative mindful like engaging and enacting those protocols and principles with with folks that you interact with yeah. on a daily whether that's like just uh, like you know non non-romantic and non whatever i feel will help to build that um resilience to to start to explore it um and then i think the other side of that is is as much as we can being authentic and like mm-hmm. truthful as much as that can be painful to others yeah. um and just sort of on I, I think a lot of it has to do with honor if we um mm-hmm enact that sort of base Mm -hmm. principle for Anishinaabe people and I imagine Nahayo people is like honor yeah like I really feel it has it all goes back to honor for sure yeah I really like it I really like how you sum that all up because it is um there is a certain degree of truth and honor like you're saying is we have to honor ourselves and and speak truth in terms of what we want in life and and how we want to live our life right and 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 the truth is it the truth is honest, like it cuts like a knife, but at the same time, it's, it gets to the core of it and there's it's not a jagged edge, you know what I mean? It Things will heal yeah. faster when we tell the truth. Right, just yeah. rip the band-aid off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then one big thing for me too, like is obviously like when it comes to um, 
learning these behaviors is like we're literally rewiring our brain like there's certain like psychology that we have to apply and i always tell people well you know make sure you get someone to help you through that like if you need to see a therapist if you find a good indigenous therapist or you find a therapist who centers on this because for like you're, you're you're right when you say you know some of our experiences around sexuality relationships are very traumatic in our mm-hmm. colonial past and even in our current reality so you know finding the support systems and the safe people to navigate these things yeah. is uh, really important and for me like a lot of my clarity did come out of like my therapy sessions with with my yeah. therapist like you know realizing and you know starting to connect dots and be like oh yeah you know there is something here um yeah. or yeah there is this, there was this experience in my past that impacted you know my ability to love or my yeah. mi- ability yeah. to be in a relationship totally. yeah. and then you get this clarity right so yeah. I, yeah i think that's like awesome is to to really foster these practical steps for people to um reconnect with themselves yeah yeah and and i think the other side of that is anyone that's listening to this um whether you're exploring that or not like i think that's that's really important is finding the safe people but always mm-hmm. be a safe person mm, yeah that's like that's what i can that's True. the number one thing like i could say is that um just always be that place of peace and like a place where someone can land yeah i think is uh is just so important for this and it takes time i know it totally takes time like i've had those visceral reactions to my own experience like navigating this um and understanding that that notion of shame doesn't come from our people we're not a shameful people right and 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 the shaming that would take place in my understanding from the Schnabek, like um um governance wasn't wasn't didn't necessarily have to do around sexualization and and mm-hmm. um romantic and whatever it was more like just like mm-hmm. um if someone just behaved badly within our communities then yeah the the way to sort of correct course correct was was shame but it wasn't an all encompassing thing that was meant to prevent people from living their authentic true um selves because that that is understood to be very violent right and everyone has their gifts and everyone has their roles and responsibilities within um our communities and so yeah i think for me the biggest thing was was connecting with folks that were um that even if they weren't in the same sort of situation that you know i may have felt myself to be in they were just non-judgmental in a safe place to like mm. land yeah totally i like it i really like it awesome we gave i think we gave our audience a lot to think about <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to think about and and to process and i'm really looking forward to seeing their comments and our interactions after this episode but i really want to thank you for your time and i really love the yeah. work you're doing i'm glad that we crossed paths and it was interesting to uh see how closely we were related to uh each other in terms of our academic journey and where we've been yeah. um but yeah thank you for your time is there any closing remarks shout outs you want to give no i just want to thank you too like i i get super nervous about these types of things because i'm like i'm like do people think oh here goes jimmy like popping off again about like all this stuff but in the notes i saw that you asked what our favorite food was so that's what i'll answer ice cream cake ice ice cream cream cake cake. nice i only eat it it like once every 20 years but it's just as sweet every time i eat it so nice good that's what i'll leave off with yeah, ice cream cake is like the go-to for our birthdays here. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it usually is the Dairy Queen one. Yeah, the, exactly yeah. the Dairy Queen yeah. ones. It's like the go-to, and then yeah, it's always a rush to get it to the wrist before it melts. And, right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's cheap. Yeah, it's totally yeah, and for our guests, our listeners out there, we do have uh, our sh- our production notes that do have uh, the same questions for everybody, and that's one of the questions we tend to ask everybody. We sometimes we don't get to the question, but I'm glad you answered it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for your time and we'll be in touch. Okay.